Good evening. Today's Wednesday. It's November 4. We are continuing our Bible study in the story of the Bible. We begin uh, today in the story of the New Testament. We had seven lessons in the Old Testament. Today is the beginning of six lessons in the New Testament. And certainly uh, it's appropriate to begin uh, this segment with the coming of Messiah. After we uh, went through the Old Testament, you know, some of the highlights of that study focused on God's plan for redemption. Uh, man had sinned, mankind had sinned, and all of humankind needed to be saved, and so God planned a redemption for us, thankfully. And as we move into the New Testament uh, this week, we see the beginning of the fulfillment of his plan of redemption. I know uh, you've heard the old saying, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. And I think it's certainly true in the human realm or in the mouse realm, as the case may be. I know we can uh, be thankful and we can uh, rest confidently that the plans of God never go awry. God has a plan and his plan is always fulfilled. And even in spite of uh, as we as we studied over the last weeks, the rebellion of God's people, Israel, and their disobedience, his plan to send his son as a savior, not only for Israel, but for all the world, was fulfilled with perfect timing. We know uh, the, the Lord had a plan. He fulfilled that. And I'm, and I'm grateful for, um, for, for that. When we look at, at scriptures, um, <clears throat> We see, uh, I want to look in the in the book of Galatians for just a moment. Let me turn there. I thought I had it open and I didn't. But Galatians um, chapter 4 and verse, and verse 4 uh, tells us, Paul's writing, When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters, as the case may be. I think it's important uh, we, we note there that God had perfect timing. God had a plan, and when the time was right, then his plan was fulfilled in the coming of Messiah. So in, in this uh, lesson today, we're going to study uh, how the focus of the Bible shifts from hearing and following God's plan for redemption of the world in the Old Testament through the prophecies, through uh, the different figures and types, uh, into the New Testament to the revelation of that plan being fulfilled in, in Christ Jesus. Um, we, I think we need to understand Jesus is the plan for God's salvation. He's not one Savior among any. He's not even at the top of the list of, of of a long list. He's the only Savior. He's the Savior, with an uppercase S, of the world. And so I believe, uh, as the church, we understand telling the world of the salvation of Jesus Christ is part of our mission. We've we've said this before. <clears throat> our mission is, is four-part. Uh, we're as the church. We're called to evangelize the world. We're called to worship God together. We're called to make disciples of all people, and we're called to be a voice and a hand of compassion in the world. And so, certainly, telling the gospel is one uh, part of of the mission of the church. And so, what we do, it's who we are. Um, Matthew, familiar scripture, chapter one, tells us. <clears throat> how the birth of Jesus came about. Verse 21 says, she, referring to Mary, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Uh, you remember the story, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later, when Jesus uh, was traveling with his parents. They had gone for, for the Passover and they were going back home again and they traveled a, a full day, full day's journey, and realized Jesus was nowhere to be found. It was probably time for dinner, and he didn't come to eat dinner. Uh, and so they said, where's the Lord? So they had to go back a day, his parents did, found him after a day, a third day. Uh, and his, um, <clears throat> his response, he said, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? 
Another way to, uh, that's said through different translations is, um, you knew I had to be about my father's business. So he went back home with them, of course, and he grew. Uh, and his mother treasured all the things that he said and did. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We'll come back to those verses a little bit later. But <clears throat> we know that God has a, has a way. God has a, a plan. Always has, always will. Um, have you ever, maybe you've received a phone call and you're on the phone and somebody says, I have something to tell you. Are you sitting down? <laughs> you know, and I always wondered about that. Does that mean if... Uh, the news is uh, strong news. It's going to knock me down. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fall over. So they want you to be sitting to receive the news so you don't fall down. I think that's the point. I've never seen that happen. But I, you get the idea. Um, the, the point of that is when someone says, are you sitting down? I have something to tell you. They are concerned about your reaction to the news they're going to give you. It, it might be good news. It might be bad news. It, it, regardless, they want you to be ready and be prepared to receive whatever news they're giving to you. Now, in the story of the birth of Jesus, Mary had some news. And she had to give that news to Joseph, who was her engaged-to-be husband. And we can understand she probably was a, a little bit nervous about um, about presenting that news to him, giving that news to him, she wasn't sure um, how he was going to how he was going to receive it. But um, thankfully, we know from the story that that Joseph had already been prepared by the by the Lord to receive the news that Mary had to give him, um, and and certainly Mary was apprehensive. She was a young girl. Um, probably middle teenager when the Lord had chosen her to be the mother of the Lord. And she was apprehensive about uh, Joseph's response, reaction to the news of her pregnancy with uh, the Christ child. Um, so we, we understand all that. I, I know we've probably studied this. We've heard messages about this and had teachings about this, but but we understand, and it's an important part of the story. The Gospel of Matthew starts with the revelation of how God miraculously um, fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament in bringing to humanity the need of a Savior, salvation from sin. And Matthew, who tells us that Mary was the mother of Jesus, who's called the Messiah, focuses on um, the, the confirmation of this news, this reality to Joseph, who was the husband of Mary. Now, they had been pledged to be married. They weren't actually man and wife. Uh, there was customarily this time where they would have this binding contract. We would probably call that an engagement uh, period uh, time, and it was usually about a year be, between the beginning of that and the conclusion as the parents were taking time to get ready the, the son the, or the groom was preparing a place for the family to live uh, and the children were being married. So it was a year between this agreement to be married and the consummation of, of that marriage. And this was the allowed uh, time uh, legally, culturally for the husband to prepare uh, to take care of his wife. He was taking a wife into his life and so he had to be ready for her. Um, so uh, but but it was a legally binding agreement. They were together, um, you know, on paper, even though they probably weren't together. They weren't uh, married, as we say today, but they were preparing for that. So this came about where Mary was pregnant. Joseph knew he was not the father. Uh, he could have called for her stoning uh, because of her infidelity and unfaithfulness to him in this agreed upon relationship uh, that that would be the extreme or he could have at least embarrassed her publicly by telling everybody look what she did he chose to do neither of those things he's not going to stone her have her stoned uh, legally he could have because she was uh, unfaithful broke the contract he could have embarrassed her publicly he chose to not do that scripture tells us he was a gracious man, he was a godly man, a righteous man, and he chose to just quietly deal with this to not embarrass her or, or hurt her 
in any way. But before he could do that, he would he was starting that process. And before he did that, the angel came to him and brought a message to him uh, in his sleep. It was a dream uh, saying Mary's pregnancy was a miracle. It was through the Holy Spirit, not through any uh, human uh, relationship. And so the son that would come from Mary, that would be born to Mary and Joseph, uh, would be named Jesus. The, the angel told Joseph, name him Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. And so Matthew gives us uh, this account uh, of the miraculous birth of Jesus through the virgin, uh, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Do you have a cup of coffee? Get one. So we see here the name Emmanuel is spoken, which means God with us. And the name assures us that God chose to redeem all of the world, all of mankind, by coming to be with humanity, God with us, in a special way. So Joseph woke up from the dream. He agreed to what God had said. He, he agreed to, to participate in, uh, in this uh, in this message and, and, and do and be uh, who God wanted him to be as the earthly father of this baby boy, Jesus. And so um, he was going to marry Mary and, and fulfill the consummation of that marriage according you know, to all that was planned. So th that all took place. We're going to jump ahead. And Jesus grew up uh, in this family, Joseph as his father, Mary as his mother. Uh, and they, the parents took responsibility to teach him and train him in the things of God and, uh, and, and be godly parents and raise him in a way that would, that would please God. I believe the Bible makes it clear that parents have a responsibility to teach their children the word of God. And now, even though Jesus was the son of God, we, we know that. Luke chapter 2, verse 41, shows us that uh, Mary and Joseph took the responsibility of parenting uh, Jesus in a godly way uh, to, to, to fulfill their parenting responsibility. Now, Mary was a righteous young woman. Joseph was a righteous young man. Uh, and so they joyfully and thankfully accepted the responsibility and the mission of, uh, of having this child. Uh, we, we certainly see both of these young people uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, righteousness was a central focus to their lives. Living for God was important. Doing uh, things God's way, living life God's way was very important. And so uh, part of that was raising him in the practice of uh, the religion of Judaism, which of course they were, they were Jews. Jews were expected to go to Jerusalem three times a year for three major festivals. One was Passover, one was Pentecost. Uh, and the third was the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus's family faithfully went to those. Now, um, we know they at least went to the festival festival of Passover annually. Luke chapter 2 and verse 41 tells us that. Um, when they went, when Jesus was 12, Luke chapter 2 t tells us that Jesus was 12 years old uh, on this occasion. And uh, it was a special occasion because Jesus, like all the boys, of, of that age, 12, uh, during that time, were, were transitioning. They were becoming a man, and they were called uh, what is what was referred to as a son of the covenant. Uh, it, it was a, a ritual, a ceremony that's still observed today in Jewish families as the bar mitzvah. Um, and he, his approval by Jewish religious leadership would would mark an important transition in his life from being a, a boy, a child, to moving into manhood. So they had gone to Jerusalem. He had participated in that uh, ceremony, that ritual. And as the group of pilgrims, all these people would travel together for safety. Uh, there would, could be dozens or scores or even, in some cases, maybe hundreds of people that would travel the same direction. And then when, you know, their exit came up, they would peel off and, you know, head off to their small town. And so they had to uh, go and they were traveling with the group. And as they traveled in this group, Mary and Joseph and the family, they left Jerusalem and returned home. Jesus stayed behind. You know the story in, in Luke chapter two, unknown to his parents. They didn't know he stayed behind. 
Now, in, in, a, in a caravan like this, it would not have been unusual for the women to travel together, you know, in a group. It wasn't that they were separated by a great distance, but the women would be in a group, the women of the family. And the men of the family would be in a group. The children usually went with the women, but remember, Jesus is now a, a man. So he would, as a young man even, a very young man, he would be traveling in a group with the men. And so they're traveling along. Uh, with the men, the older boys in one group, and the women and the younger children are together in another group. And it's even possible that because of his age, right on the edge, uh, Jesus could have gone back and forth between the two groups. You know, he'd go over and see mom for a while, and then he'd go over and see dad for a while. And so it's very believable and possible that Joseph thought he was with Mary, and Mary thought he was with Joseph, and he was with neither. He stayed behind in Jerusalem. And so his absence was not noticed until the end of the of the first travel day. And so when they got together at evening time uh, to eat, where's Jesus? Well, neither one know where Jesus So they turned around and they went back to Jerusalem, Mary and Joseph did, a day's journey. Remember, it took them a day to get where they were. So they turned around, went back another full day. And finally, on the third day, they found Jesus in uh, the temple. And he was interacting with the teachers of the law, the scribes and the teachers of the law. And his conversation were of, of such level of, of uh, knowledge and, and understanding that the teachers and the ones who witnessed what was going on were astonished that a 12-year-old would have such an insightful, full understanding of God's revelation to, to Israel. You read that in Luke 2.45. They were amazed that Jesus had understanding like. And so when Mary and Joseph found him and say, what have you been doing? Where have you been? His response un uh, revealed his understanding of why he was here. He said, I have to be in my father's house. I have to be in the temple. Even at the age of 12, Jesus understood the will of, the, of his heavenly father, even better than Mary and Joseph understood. So the divine will of God was evidence in Jesus's uh, life. And, and uh, as he returned to Nazareth, he grew up, uh, learned the trade of Joseph, the carpent, carpenter trade, and God uh, put favor on, on Jesus. So uh, this ongoing regular participation in the religious life of Judaism was a foundation block of the family. Mary and Joseph's home was centered around the religious life of Judaism. I think it's important that we have spiritual foundations in our homes. Uh, it gives the, the proper setting for children. Uh, Jesus was raised and grew up that way, and, and I believe it's important for our children uh, the, same, the same way. It's important that we attend church faithfully, that this be a part of our life. Uh, then we move along uh, and and uh, we, we move ahead to Jesus' uh, public ministry, uh, and, and we see that he, um, we, we miss several years in there. We don't know a lot about what took place in his life other than he was living life. He was a carpenter and, and so forth. We do know uh, that when he was born, right before uh, he was born, John the Baptist was born. Now, John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. You look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 36 and you see that. And we know that even before John was born, before Jesus was born, God had a plan for Jesus to be introduced to the people of Israel as the promised Messiah. And John was the one who introduced Jesus. John was preaching a message of repentance and a message of baptism. Uh, and he would speak that to, um, to the people who would come out to hear. Um, his message challenged them, challenged the people that came out to hear to repent, turn from their sinful ways, and, and be baptized. And Jesus aligned himself with this, not because he needed to be baptized and repent because he never sinned, but he was identifying with them. And so it was, it was obvious and evident that the anointing of the Holy Spirit was upon him. Uh, there's one situation there in Luke chapter 3 where he's in the water and the voice from God came 
and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, symbolized by a dove, rested on him. And then, of course, Jesus was there. And so we see the Trinity, the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, represented by the voice, the Spirit, represented by the dove, and then, of course, the Son in the flesh, uh, in the water, being baptized. And so um, from the Jordan baptism, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness uh, for a time of testing, which enabled him, which enabled Jesus to, to, to uh, begin a public ministry, a teaching ministry, a healing ministry in the synagogues uh, around Galilee. And so his regular participation in the religious life of Judaism, as we said, started in his hometown of Nazareth by, um, by his parents. And it continued when he's chosen to read the scripture from Isaiah 61, proclaiming uh, that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy that Isaiah had given, uh, saying that an anointed one would come to proclaim the good news. And Jesus said, today this is fulfill, fulfilled in your hearing. And so he's given the authority to heal. He's given the authority to, to forgive. Luke chapter 4, he went to Capernaum, a village uh, up on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, which was also the home of uh, Peter uh, and, um, and Andrew and other disciples. And as was his custom, he read that scripture. It, it was his custom to go into the, ta the, the, the tabernacle and he was given the responsibility to read that day, and he read that, and it's recorded in Luke chapter 4. And he said, so today, this is fulfilled. And, and the, the key here is, they would have read the scripture every week. But the difference here is, as he spoke this, the anointing flowed from him, and, and the people recognized this. It was not his words, but it was God's words um, being being fulfilled uh, at that time, the beginning of his ministry. Um, the anointing of the Spirit on Jesus and in Jesus was regularly strengthened as he would go off into uh, times of prayer alone with the Father. There are many accounts and, and many stories told of, of, of Jesus going off to pray. Uh, and then the result of that, many accounts and many stories told of Jesus healing people and restoring, and, uh, whether he raised a paralytic or he raised the dead, uh, the, the, the power of God was certainly on him. Um, not the least aspect of his work is Jesus dying for the sins of mankind. Jesus did not come only to heal people and teach, and restore, and help. Jesus died for sinners. And so, um, the, the words of Isaiah and many of the other prophets regarding the Messiah came to fulfillment in, uh, in John and in chapter 19, uh, when we see the sacrificial system of the Old Testament pointing to the sinless Lamb of, of God who would lay down his life to redeem humanity from sin. Um, we know the story. Pilate tried over and over repeatedly to um, release Jesus. He tried to convince the Jews, the Jewish leadership, of the innocence of Jesus, and, and they would have nothing to do with it. So Pilate gave in and handed him over to be crucified. And Jesus obeyed the will of God, submitted to the cross in the most cruel uh, manner of death, uh, certainly at that time, and, and and probably you know through through uh, through history, he went to the cross and was crucified. Um, but thankfully, the horrors of crucifixion did not end with Jesus's death, and it did not end God's plan. Jesus rose from the dead, and the gospel accounts give the story of Jesus's resurrection. They they all show the importance of the women. Uh, in this, Mary was the the first to arrive uh, at the tomb. Mary Magdalene was the first to arrive at the tomb on the first day of the week. She found the stone rolled away, and um, it was Mary who shared the news with Peter and John. It was Mary who encouraged the um, uh, who 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 told them, "This is what I found." It was Mary 
who met Jesus, the risen Jesus, at the entrance to the tomb. It was also Mary who witnessed to the disciples that she had seen the Lord. And so um, I, I think it's important, you know, Mary came from a questionable background. Mary Magdalene came from a questionable background and certainly uh, would have been held in low esteem. But generally speaking, at the time, uh, women were held in low social status. They were not uh, equal with men. Um, and so I believe the Lord was showing, at least on one level, the Lord was showing, uh, having witnessed witnesses to be women in this very powerful event, um, God is showing the inclusiveness of his work through Jesus. It's for everybody. Uh, Paul said later, in Christ, we're not, we're not um, male or female, we're not bound or free, we're not Jew or Gentile, we're, we're all in Christ. Everybody is in Christ, and I'm thankful for that. It's not a, it, the gospel is not closed to any segment of society in any way. All are welcome to, to come to Jesus. And so Mary certainly had a role in pointing people uh, to this new relationship with Jesus. And it's interesting. It's not, it had been at one point dependent upon a physical relationship in the sense of they were with the Lord every day. They ate with him. They walked with him. They were with him. But then eventually he's gone. And so it becomes a spiritual relationship. They were friends in the sense that they um, uh, were physically together. In fact, there's one point where Jesus was told, uh, Jesus told Mary, do not hold on to me. So he's saying our relationship has to be spiritual. Don't hold on to me. We're not bound by physical limitation, uh, but we have the, the power of the spirit. And so it wasn't just physical in the sense of being in the physical presence of someone, uh, listening to a teaching, sharing a meal, walking along the road, but it's a spiritual relationship wherein the Lord is always with us. And I'm thankful for that. You know, in spite of the sin of Adam and Eve and the frailty of uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the mistakes that different ones made, Moses and David, um, ultimately the rebellion of Israel, God never gave up. I'm glad for that. He doesn't give up today. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't given up on your family. He sent his son to die for the sins of all mankind. Jesus rose from the dead. He got victory over the devil, victory over the grave, and we can rejoice in his love for us. Amen. That's the gospel. That's the story of the New Testament, and I'm thankful for that. I believe we, uh, as followers of Christ today, should look for ways to share the, the plan of salvation with someone who needs a relationship with Jesus. How can you share the gospel with somebody? Ask the Lord to help you and then do that. Um, just like Jesus spent time with the Father to strengthen his relationship, we need to do that as well. We need to spend time in the word and spend time in prayer that we can be the people that God wants us to be. Amen. Let's take a moment and pray and ask God to cement this to our hearts and help us to be who he's called us to be. Thank you, Lord. For this word, thank you for the New Testament and all that it is and all that it means. I pray you'd bless it to our hearts. Help us to share this gospel with someone who needs to know Jesus. Lord, strengthen us, we pray, in our relationship. Uh, let us be men of God, women of God, full of faith, full of your spirit, full of the word, pleasing you in every way. Lord, we trust you. We thank you that you'd help us uh, to do this. Lord, I pray for your people. Continue to bring health and healing. Restore us. Lord, many need a miracle. We ask for that today in the name of Jesus. Well, we continue to pray for our nation. Lord, be glorified in what happens. Lord, uh, as decisions are made and uh, votes from yesterday are counted, we pray, Father, that uh, you would be glorified, that your will would be done and accomplished in our land and, and in us as your people. We thank you, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. Well, God bless you. Good to be with you for a moment. We'll uh, be back again uh together tomorrow, Thursday, Lord willing. And remember, we have special music guests coming on Sunday. It'll be a good day. So God bless you. Have a, a great rest of your day, and we'll see you again soon.